All right, thank you, John. It's uh, important for us to hear your voice here today. So next we're gonna move to um, our panel, our community panel, and Michelle Boone, the Director of Clinical Services from Stark County Mental Health and Addiction Recovery is gonna lead us in that. So please welcome Michelle. Sorry, I'm a little shorter. Good, good morning. And so I don't, if our panelists could come up and join us at this time too. Um, and so this uh, session, we're going to talk a little bit about um, kind of behavioral health. And when I say behavioral health, I mean mental health and addiction um, in our community. And so on our panel, um, we have uh, Dr. Ruth Ann Anderson, who's the program director at Walsh's uh, Counseling and Human Development Program. We also have Julie Stone, uh, instructor at Byers School of Nursing, and Keith Hohadl, who is the executive director for ComQuest, a local provider agency in Stark County. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about, um, and give an opportunity of each of the panelists to introduce themselves a little bit more, um, and talk about what they see from their perspective uh, as what's going on in our community, both um, successes or strengths as opportunity areas as well. And then we'll also have some time, hopefully, at the end for audience uh, question and answer as we're, as we're going through. So I will turn it over uh, to Dr. Anderson to start us off. Good, af good morning. I thought we were going to be in the afternoon. So good morning. Um, I have been working as a clinical mental health counselor for over 30 years. That's a long time in this field. Um, most of my work has been in community agencies that receive both state and uh, county funding. And so when we were li listening to John just a minute ago and he's talking about uh, Medicaid dollars, uh, we're, we're also looking at uh, behavioral health redesign. We were also agencies that would receive discretionary monies that are available from the local uh, mental health and addiction recovery boards. The area of Ohio where I have worked is rural Ohio. It's in the southern part of the state, Belmont, Harrison, and Monroe counties, and so we have a very different situation there because we are rural. <clears throat> but uh, the thing that I know is that counselors play a pretty key role in what we do. Uh, in terms of providing care, um, when I'm working as a counselor, I might have a, a, a psychological assistant, which is a master's level trained person with um, a psychology focus. And on the other side of me, I am going to have a licensed social worker who can be doing the same thing. One of the things that John Eller talked about, which is unfortunate, is that the Medicare law was written before the, the uh, profession of counseling existed. And so counselors aren't written in that little laundry list of providers that can receive reimbursement. And so this definitely is an issue for the, the counseling field. We have been on multiple bills, uh, unfortunately minor additions to larger bills in front of Congress that gets passed by the House or not by the Senate or vice versa because we are in a budget crunch and we're trying not to spend money. Um, and so that continues to be a battle that counselors fight. Um, I have been involved in some of these diversion programs that we've talked about and seen the successes that can happen. Uh, we had a diversion program for first-time offenders in uh, juvenile population for drug offenses. And I was active in getting uh, a, a deferment program going for batterers in domestic violent crimes. Also was a, a part of a sexual assault task force that brought together, uh, I think we had mentioned before, the village of people that it takes to bring about change. And so we had everyone from lawyers to uh, police officers and everyone in between to come up with uh, a countywide plan in how we were going to respond when there was a sexual assault crime of any kind that would happen in the county. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've been working here full-time and doing my clinical practice part-time. Uh, I am the program director of Walsh's Uni Walsh University's Counseling and Human Development Program. 
The state of Ohio is actually a forerunner in uh, counseling. It's one of the more difficult states to get licensed in, and it is the first state who has written into counseling license law uh, the requirement of a graduating from uh, a nationally accredited education program. The, as of this year, 2018, all counseling students must graduate from a KCREP accredited program in order to be licensed in the state of Ohio. Um, our program has two KCREP accredited programs. One is in school counseling and the other is in clinical mental health counseling. And we are in the process of exploring the addition of another program, addictions counseling, which we hope to be KCREP accredited and we plan to also offer as a certificate program for providers that are out in the field and would like to come back and get the training that would be necessary for them to get the independent chemical dependency license. Um, so th I'm glad to be a part of this panel. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. And I would um, add, and this is also part of what um, John talked about as well related to workforce development. Um, you know, I think that that is a huge piece that um, Walsh is able to help be local here in our community with the counseling program, and I went through it myself and graduated. Um, and so I know that I appreciate the experience that I received with, um, you know, understanding mental health and addiction treatment, um, as well as some of the other opportunities around um, cultural and linguistic competence. You know, how are we helping to engage underserved um, populations in our community um, and really meet where people, meet them where they're at and get them linked up with the services that they need. And so again, part of that also comes from, you know, we have to have the workforce in place in the community to be able to get folks into the services um, and have um, access readily available. All right, so up next, I'll just kind of run down the line. So Julie Stone uh, is next up. If you could share from your perspective, um, you know, kind of what you're seeing in the community for Stark County um, in the School of Nursing, as well as opportunity areas. Hi, so as she mentioned, I'm on faculty here at the Byers School of Nursing, but I'm also a psychiatric nurse practitioner. And so that's really more what I wanted to talk about today was that role. Um, so originally, there weren't nurse practitioners, there were clinical nurse specialists back in the 1950s, and they pretty much just did counseling. They didn't really do medications like we do now. Over time, that role has kind of evolved, evolved, and in the 1980s, nurse practitioners took on the role that we could actually prescribe, um, which really changed a lot of things. So there's still some states that have a lot of restrictions on nurse practitioners and they don't allow them to practice completely independently. Um, Ohio being one of those, we have to collaborate with the physician, which basically means they are like an added support for us. So we can ask questions, seek further evaluations from the physicians. Um, and they can kind of assist us in the patient's care. 23 out of 50 states in the United States actually nurse practitioners can practice completely independently. Hopefully, Ohio will go down that avenue soon. We're working on that. Um, and there's actually been a lot of recent legislation rego regarding the role and practice of a nurse practitioner. One of the big changes um, in 2017 that expanded our ability to prescribe was um, now we can prescribe the medication-assisted treatment for um, people who are, um, have addiction issues. So we can prescribe Suboxone and things like that now. So that's really... Um, helped for access to care. Um, a lot of the things we've talked about today is, you know, getting access to services, getting access immediately that day, and, and how difficult that is. Um, part of the, the reason why that access to care issue with medications is the decline in practicing psychiatrists. Um, in the last decade, there's been a decline in at least 10%, um, and it's predicted that the shortage will be 25% of practicing psychiatrists by 2025. So obviously there's a huge need for nurse practitioners to come help take over that role in addition with psychiatrists to prescribing mental health medications. Um, studies have shown that 75% of U.S. counties have a severe shortage of mental health prescribers. So 75%, that's quite a bit. Um, and 43 out of 50 states report a severe shortage of providers, with Ohio being one of those. So... With the reduction of psychiatrists in the workforce and, of course, the increase of mental health care needs like we've talked about today, um, one of the ways that we can 
kind of create more access to care is by having more psychiatric nurse practitioners. Um, so psych psychiatric nurse practitioners can actually assess, diagnose, treat individuals, families, and groups just like a psychiatrist can. So we can prescribe the full scope of medications just like a psychiatrist can. Like I mentioned now, since 2017, we can do medication-assisted treatments like Suboxone. Um, we can also provide psychotherapy in addition to the counseling staff. Um, we can work in inpatient settings, community mental health agencies, private practices, in addition with primary care offices, correctional facilities, with veterans, with schools, help provide services for addiction. As of 2017, there were 166,000 nurse practitioners in the country, with about 14,000 of those being trained specifically for mental health. But only 700 of them are actually in Ohio. So we obviously have a need. So with all of that being said, I am very excited to share the news with you that Walsh is in the final stages of implementing a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner program that we're gonna be beginning. Um, students will be able to earn a master's or a doctoral degree. We'll also have a post-master's certificate for nurse practitioners trained in family medicine or other um, disciplines besides mental health. And this is a way that Walsh can help to alleviate the shortage of qualified mental health prescribers in our area by educating, graduating more qualified providers so we can get that same day access that John mentioned. Um, so we're very excited about this. Um, Yeah, so we're very excited about the program. I believe that we'll be able to train more future nurse practitioners here at Walsh University's Byers School of Nursing. We'll be able to provide easier access to mental health care, and we're meeting a great need that I believe we can make a great impact. Thank you, Julie. And I would also um, you know, echo that uh, something that um, Dr. Murray mentioned earlier about interdisciplinary collaboration. And I know other folks have mentioned also public health approaches. And so it's important that, you know, not just one discipline to another, that we're working together um, to provide kind of that coordinated care, comprehensive treatment services, uh, holistic care for an individual. Um, but it's also, you know, bigger than that. So how does one, um, you know, system or one sector work with each other? So how does criminal justice and the treatment field work together? Um, how does um, maybe a private uh, primary care physician work with the behavioral health treatment arena as well? Um, and a piece of that too is how do we then um, as a community work to reduce stigma? So not just that we have access to care, but people are actually um, willing to talk about you know, their behavioral health needs as part of their overall physical health. Um, and they're not, you know, maybe afraid or concerned about getting into treatment services in the community um, that we're actually, you know, again, putting that person first and recognizing um, for them for who they are. So our language that we use is really important um, as part of that. And it also goes along with trauma-informed care that was mentioned earlier. So, you know, are we talking about a person or an individual who has a disorder, or are we talking about them and using, maybe we're calling them an addict or a borderline, you know, and wherein really we should be reframing that and seeing a person with a substance use disorder or a person um, with depression diagnosis. So just a couple of things to kind of think about as a community, how we can all kind of help pull together and you know, really address stigma around mental health and substance use disorders um, in our community. Um, and then I w let it turn it over to Keith uh, as the executive director of ComQuest, um, if you wanna share a little bit more about yourself and then again, kind of from the community agency perspective, um, you know, what are you seeing as some um, strengths in the work that you're doing, as well as some maybe gaps or opportunity areas that we can we can work together to address. Sure, thanks, Michelle. So one, we're really excited about the nurse practitioner program. So thank you, <laughs> and the counseling program as well. Judge Loftus spoke about uh, one in five folks um, having mental health issues. Um, Surgeon General came out with a report a couple years ago that also said that about one in seven are impacted by substance use disorders. So just to give you a perspective, probably 15, 20 years ago, that number was one in 10. So the, the, the prevalence of folks that, that are impacted by substance use, the prevalence of folks that are impacted by mental health continues to impact our community and, and, and 
our, our uh, workforce significantly. But what I found fascinating is one in four families have been somehow impacted by uh, the opiate and the substance use stuff. So if I'm in a grocery store, if I'm in church, if I'm at work, I know that about one in four families are impacted by that. That's a significant number for any community. And what we've seen in our community is we've seen the, the number of suicides that occurred last year of our young folks. We saw the number of overdose deaths in our community that have impacted a number of families. And when John talks about access to treatment, think about this. If I get a flat tire on the way home and I call AAA, they can come and fix my tire in about an hour, okay? But when people's brains and bodies are broken, we used to be making them wait weeks, sometimes months to get services, whether it was medication assisted recovery or whether it was psychiatric services. We have done a remarkable job and there's a number of providers in this room today that have, have just laid it out there and said, look, we're gonna get access to care today right now because that's when people need to have that. So I think all of us as, as providers have, have placed that focus on. Stark County is a really unique community. One, because we have a full continuum of care. On the psychiatric side, we have a state hospital that sits in our community. Um, we, have, we have psychiatry, we have community psychiatric nurse practitioners, we have outpatient services. Um, we have pharmacies co-located within our organizations. On the drug and alcohol side, we have inpatient detox, outpatient detox, residential care for adults and kids. We have a full scope of medication assisted recovery with methadone, suboxone, and Vivitrol, okay? And what we also have is we have prevention and education in our schools and in our communities and in our churches. We have cooperative judges, cooperative police departments and sheriffs that work together that not every community has. And as a result of that, when this community is faced with the challenge, whether it was the suicide stuff or whether it was the opiate stuff, this community moved towards solutions. And what Walsh is doing through the nurse practitioner program is moving towards solutions as well. See, we can't do this alone. Not one segment of the community has the ability to do this. Yes, we have a workforce shortage. You know, a number of years ago when, when the infinite wisdom of those people who are licensing bodies decided that people that were in recovery couldn't just get enough continuing educations to get a, a certificate or get a license to, to practice chemical dependency counseling, we lost a workforce. And that group's catching up, so I'm glad to hear about the addictions program. That's outstanding. We have lots of new medications that impact people's brains. And because we have lots of different people prescribing them, they may go, jump from practitioner to practitioner to practitioner. We don't have a long track record to see how all of these new medications that impact people's brains are, uh, are affecting them. So we see more and more folks with mental illness seeking services where we have to kind of tease out all of that stuff that takes place of that. And we continue to treat chronic diseases such as mental health and addiction services like they're a cough and a cold by 30-day treatment mechanisms, 60-day treatment mechanisms, because that's what the payer system tells us we can do. See, those are all of the things that we're faced with. In January, when we went through what the state, in their infinite wisdom, called behavioral health redesign, and we got new codes and reimbursement structures, and we went from 13 codes to what John said is 150, but what I believe is about 250. Okay, and, and 26 different people that could provide that service at different rates of reimbursement. And then we moved to managed care where we have five groups of people we're billing to. So we went from a, from a matrix of 13 and one rate and, and, and a couple payer sources to 250 by 25 by five, it gets complicated. And guess what? It gets costly. That business model that's supposed to be so much more efficient and so much better for client care is now costing more money. And at some point, that's gonna jeopardize access to care if we don't fix this system. So community events like this, the great work that Stark Marr does, the great work that Walsh and other universities do, lead us to, to have some success. See, this continuum care continues to change. And in, re, in, in, in our community, because we've placed an emphasis on making sure that we're taking care of folks in our community. This community moved towards recovery. 
We have all kinds of stigma. But you know, the really thing that, the thing that bothers me about stigma is that when our clients miss an appointment on the mental health side because they missed a bus and they're 10 minutes late or they're 15 minutes late and somebody says, whoa, you're late, I'm not taking you today. Do we have any idea what the impact of that is when they have to circle back and try and come another day and at four o'clock on a Friday, they've realized through no fault of their own, but really in some cases to blame their, to be able to have that impacted by their mental health, they forget that they're out of medication. Have we thought about those folks that have addiction, that act out in their addiction by testing positive on a drug screen? And we say, you know what, we're done, you need to be out of treatment. When all they're doing is doing the very thing that got them into treatment services in the first place. See, I believe through the impact of brain chemistry that we've learned about and the impact of having better access to care in our community, that we will continue to provide hope to those people that are across from us. Because any chance you get to shake a hand, any chance you get to provide a hug to somebody, you are giving them the hope that their life can be better. So, all right, that's my soapbox. <laughs> Thank you, Keith. Let's give the panelists a round of applause before we move. Thank you all. And I do, I do echo, um, you know, one sentiment that Keith talked about around kind of the community collaborations that um, are available in Stark County and um, both existing and, and future ones to come. I mean, I do think that that is one of our strengths in the community is that, you know, we all are trying to work together for the benefit um, betterment of our county um, and it's that kind of working together that where we'll kind of be successful and pull together with um, you know reducing stigma and providing that access to care that was talked about as well um, so I'll start off with a question and then if folks have questions I don't know if we're are we doing I, I see folks with microphones so if folks could raise their hands and they'll be around um, I'll start off with a question um, kind of in the vein of, of the reducing stigma. And so, um, panelists, from your perspective, um, how is either your program or agency um, working to kind of help address and reduce stigma around behavioral health and individuals receiving services? Well, uh, in terms of educating uh, clinical practitioners, reducing stigma uh, is something that we train throughout the program. Um, they come into this program because they have a passion to care, a passion to serve. And uh, sometimes they don't even understand how stigmatizing uh, a mental health diagnosis is, let alone uh, be being identified as abusing substances and then hopefully not both at the same time. So what we do is we try to help them understand what the people that they are serving are going to be encountering so that they understand how difficult it is for them to reach out for services uh, to promote that level uh, of understanding and how they develop rapport and how they uh, deal with the resistance that can occur when they're working with individuals and they're encountering the realities of their substance use or their mental illness for the first time. Because then what will happen is those individuals are going to push back, they're going to become resistant. And so how will we as practitioners help those individuals through those initial stages so that they can stay in treatment and actually meet some of the goals that they have. If we can't do that as practitioners, then what will happen is those individuals will leave treatment. They'll continue to suffer from their illness, they'll continue to suffer from substance use. And so we work very hard to make sure that the counselors that graduate from our program understand that resistance and work with it to promote wellness. I, I think for us, a lot of it's around education, um, providing as many opportunities to, to get out into the community and, and share um, not just what mental health or drug and alcohol looks like, but, but what recovery looks like. Um, it's important for people to understand that, that, that recovery does exist and recovery does work. Um, it's important for, for employers to understand that. So on the mental health side, we have a supportive employment program 
um, where those folks who are in, in, involved in the mental health side have an opportunity to gain employment. We go out and we, we do some coach, job coaching with them. And I think it's important that, that we spread that message out there. It's important that we encourage our, our, those folks that seek services with us that while they may be, may be struggling and there's other folks out there that don't see them the same way, that, that they have an opportunity um, to, to succeed in life and succeed in the community. And I think lastly, you know, if you look at the community as kind of like the little mobile that hangs over a baby's bed, when you pull on one of those little Disney characters, the whole mobile moves. And I think sometimes what we forget is when we pull on one segment of our community, the whole community moves. It's not just that one individual. And we need to make sure that, that we're sharing that message of encouragement and hope and education across the community so that, so that people do understand that there is that stigma out there. And, and it's not just with community members, it's, it's with staff that come to work with us. They, they don't, like you said, they don't necessarily know you know, there, there's no picture in a, in a book that says this is what somebody with mental health looks like. You know, there's all kinds of role play videos and that, but that's not truly what they look like. They look like us. Mm -hmm. And I know, Jovi, did you want to? It's just the fact that we're having this today is, I mean, we're helping to break the stigma just sitting all here talking. This wouldn't have happened a couple of years ago. So I think that's a great positive um, move forward. Yeah, thank you. And I think the other thing is to just think about, you know, if you're not in, um, you know, a helping profession, so if you're not in physical health or behavioral health, you know, as a community member, there's always education and awareness um, activities out there, as well as I know I saw um, there's a table over there for mental health first aid. Um, there's several entities, Stark Mars, one in the community that has um, instructors trained for mental health first aid, and anyone in the community can take that. Um, it's really valuable education about, you know, how to um, recognize somebody who might be struggling and help get them to that um, assistance that they need. And I think I saw a question in the back. This is going to be kind of a fuzzy question that I'll try to clarify as I go along. But Mr. Aller made reference to the uh, uh, ch Family and Children First Council, which is a collaborative council that brings together folks like from... Uh, uh, developmental disabilities, uh, Department of Job and Family Services, Mental Health Recovery Board, court system, and they try to collaborate, but they often have different mandates that they are responding to. Uh, they often view their clientele, if you will, as, as separate, not always overlapping the way we all know they do. And there's such budgetary issues with, uh, with uh, every uh, agency right now. I'm just wondering, you know, with with courts now being a primary referral source uh, for practitioners, and the nice thing from a practitioner standpoint when they look at court referrals is they say, oh, this is a this is a guaranteed paycheck because they're mandated. If they don't do it, they're going to go to jail or they're going to have some other consequence involved. I'm just wondering. What's being done to educate new practitioners or folks who are in university settings about these different mandates, these different uh, demands that different agencies and, and different uh, uh, organizations have to respond to? And how do you assist those practitioners in working oftentimes with a court-involved forensic population because these are tough folks to work with? I can speak from the training point of view. Uh, one of the things that we pretty clearly identify with within our program is that most of the clients that you're going to be working with aren't really ready for change. And so it's not going to be surprising when you receive uh, a court referred client that they are, they don't even recognize that they need to change. And so we, we train our clinicians to work with individuals that are at that stage of change. We also have uh, courses that kind of tease out the complication in actually working in a mental health agency, all the players that are involved and all of the um, collaboration that needs to occur. One of the difficulties that I've encountered as a clinician in working with court-referred clients, and I'm not sure how the judges would respond to this, but we'll frequently have a, a client that 
in their resistance will be occasionally missing appointments, but maybe not missing appointments enough so that we know exactly, do we need to call the probation officer, do we need to let the court know because we want to keep them in counseling and we hope to see them recover or get well. And, and so that, that becomes a really difficult uh, decision to make. We train our clinicians to kind of think about the wellness of the client, to recognize the resistance, but then you have agency mandates then that will overlay that, and every agency is going to have a different set of expectations. And I suppose, John, you could speak to the way ComQuest deals with that because you've got the court-referred clients, but that becomes a combination of a judgment call and the training of the clinician to the mandate of the agency. So I, I think a couple things. Uh, when we have somebody who's referred from the court for services, oftentimes if they're a multi-system referral, um, we need to find out what other systems they may be part of. So, and, and not always are those clients all forthcoming and telling us what all systems they might be involved in. The other challenge we, we currently are, are into and, and is that with managed care kind of taking over the Medicaid system, anybody that's court ordered, if that appears anywhere in their document and we bill another commercial insurance or Medicaid, we are most likely going to be asked to pay that money back because their feeling is if the court's ordering somebody to treatment services, or some sort of services, then the court ought to be the responsible payer. And courts don't have any more money than we do. So, <laughs> um, so again, I, I, our criminal justice system does a really nice job of, of giving clients freedom of choice. You have a choice. You can go to receive services or you can go over here to the, uh, to the locked up drug and alcohol mental health service center called the jail. Um, so again, I, I think that just teasing out all of those things, but again, you know, one of the, one of the orientation processes when somebody comes to work for us is here are all of the systems that people could be at. Okay. So they may not know what Phoenix Rising does or Pathway Caring for Children or, or any of the other agencies. So we have to educate them on what those pr providers do as well. And I think that's part of why relationships are so important as a piece of that collaboration is understanding that other systems culture um, and you know what their mandates are, whether it's you know programmatic mandates or to your point, funding mandates. Um, and I think that's where you know being able to have conversations about you know what does something cost um, and who's able to you know be able braid funding, so maybe a portion of that, you know, the behavioral health system funds and a portion of that maybe the court system has funds to bring to the table. Um, we've had other uh, programs in the community and I know um, Judge mentioned Polaris program, that would be a current example um, where some of those conversations have taken place. So I do think it is, you know, that relationship piece and the collaboration about, you know, having those, those kind of hard discussions and really kind of getting to the place where you're understanding where the other person or the other system's coming from and what are your common goals. Good question. And I think I saw another hand, yes. Hi, um, you talked earlier about uh, education for employers, and, and so the third leg of the stool may actually be the private sector uh, as well. And, and, and so I'm wondering sort of a, a hypothetical, if we swapped out this audience for uh, an audience of business leaders, uh, what would you be telling HR directors and what sorts of policies would you hope to be seeing from the private sector uh, in order to help uh, respond? Because employers all over are talking about 
loss of productivity and the cost of these issues in the, in the workplace. So what should the private sector be doing that they're not doing right now? So I, I think that one of the things that, that we're seeing is that the, the business sector has started to come to they So I know, or I'm pretty sure that the whatever number of folks I have in residential treatment, when they're done with their 60, 90 days in their, in their continued care, they're going to be drug free and they understand the drug testing policy. So our hope is that, uh, that we make vocational opportunities available and that we have um, business members in the community that do that. So I'll give you an example. So uh, 20 some years ago, I lost my pharmacy license because of my own addiction. So the first job I went to was to get a, a landscaping job because I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And the guy said, I'm sorry, one, you have a college degree, you're not practicing in that, and you're a drug addict, so I'm not going to hire you. You know, without even looking at what my work history was before that. And we have a number of folks that, that are in treatment services that have done extremely well, had really good track records, but hit a bump in the road for some reason. And they have an opportunity to continue in that employment. So we're working with, with Stark State because they have some short-term certificate programs that have been, been helpful. You know, we, we have oil and gas um, jobs available. Um, you know, there's a number of employers who have reached out to us and said, hey, look, do, what's your workforce look like? We work with a group called Men's Challenge, which is a faith-based community um, organization called that, that helps men that are employable get employed. Um, so again, I think it's things like that, that, that we just go out and, and we want to share that here's a workforce you might not have thought about that for the most part, I can tell you are clean, are clean and sober um, and have a pretty good handle on that. My concern with some of those is where's their work tolerance? Are they physically capable of working a 40 hour work week right off the bat? when maybe they haven't been physically active for a period of time. So, but I, again, I, I think my message to, to, the, to the business community is the same as it's been. We, ha we have people that would like to work and, and they're good workers and, and they deserve an opportunity as well. One of the things that I thought about when you asked the question, Dr. Palmer, too, is, is um, if there were a bunch of business people out there um, talking, you know, list, asking us questions. As, as an administrator of, of an agency that received the county and, and state funding, I, I was able to watch agencies that were not maybe operating very well as business entities have to move into fee-for-service. And now we're moving from fee-for-service into managed care. And it's a, I think it's an uncomfortable marriage between a group of people who have entered into a profession because they care and because they want to make a difference in the lives of other people. And now we have to be in a business. And being in a business means that as much as I might want to provide a service for a group of people, if I don't have a line item for that and I don't have enough money for that, then I can't provide the service. And it might break my heart being in an agency that is under the Mental Health and Addiction Recovery Board means that I might have a certain amount of what the board calls discretionary money. And that discretionary money gets allotted in a budget that goes here, there, and it's pretty tightly managed. And so even though I might have some dollars that I can give away to certain groups of people, those dollars are very tightly managed. What that means to me as a practitioner is I have to turn away people. And so we have a pretty uncomfortable marriage with this business model that we have to follow now, and especially now with this redesign. Yeah, and I think the other opportunity for the business community is, um, you know, in addition to the workforce and some of the kind of changing landscape, is really around that education and awareness. Um, you know, our suicide, and this is nationally, but also holds true in um, Ohio, outside of the youth uh, suicide cluster that we had experienced, um, you know, Caucasian middle-aged males are the number one group um, for uh, suicide completion. And so, you know, how are we kind of reaching out to, you know, folks that we're working with every day to check in with them, 
or how comfortable do they feel with, you know, maybe getting and talking to their doctor about any kind of mental health or substance use um, disorder uh, concerns that they might have. So I think that's the other piece of that is the connection in with um, our workforce is making sure that we're having those conversations um, and making sure that folks are comfortable with having them to start. All right, other questions? I see hands. I don't, does anyone have a microphone? Oh, I don't, there's a woman right there in the front. Thank you. My question is um, for the average family, say in Stark County, who is not in this system, doesn't have any of this training, any of this awareness, isn't involved with any of these organizations that are doing great work, they have a crisis in the family, say a suicide threat. How do they get help without calling the police who aren't necessarily, it's not a criminal situation, it's someone who is having a mental breakdown. Mm -hmm. What do they, do they get online and search psychiatry? I mean, yeah. what are you for so, educating the regular mm -hmm. folks? Yeah, so there is a newer service in Stark County, um, and John mentioned it during his presentation, uh, is the mobile response teams. And so there's a youth team as well as an adult team um, that is operated um, through Coleman. Uh, it's by calling the same number that folks are familiar with, that um, crisis hotline, um, 452-6000. Uh, they will we'll respond out in the community 24-7. Uh, wherever that individual is at that is in need of urgent behavioral health services. Um, if it is a situation where, you know, that person or family isn't known to uh, mobile responders, they would potentially ask a law enforcement officer to accompany them, but again, it's just to ensure safety, and that's explained up front. Um, it's not, you know, they're not going out, and often they'll ask for a crisis um, intervention trained police officer, um, if possible, to accompany them. But they will be able to do a risk assessment there on the spot and a safety plan and create kind of a plan uh, or disposition, you know, what needs to happen and stay with them until they can get connected into ongoing services uh, in the community. Good question. I have a question. Um, I work real closely in the harm reduction community, um, and I don't refer people to treatment, but I have had some pretty good success uh, relating with some of the people that I, I deal with, and I've, I've been able to guide quite a few of them into detox or treatment. And recently I've been able to um, guide two young men into Wilson Hall and detox. My question is, <clears throat> excuse me, with ComQuest being the only provider of detox in Stark County right now, um, has there any, been anything put in place to be able to effectively treat and give attention to all these people that have been going through. I know that your numbers are a lot higher than they were, say, two or three years ago. Um, and I know that what you do is phenomenal. I'm not discrediting anything that you do. I just worry about the one-on-one the -on -one and the effectiveness of treatment for these people that go through with so many people in the houses. So I, I think we're, we're constantly looking at how we provide treatment services. Um, you know, so uh, the, uh, the success rate a number of years ago, somebody told me it was like 15%. And then one year we celebrated that we had 60% that of people that came through one of our programs that were clean and sober a year afterwards. And, Somebody said, how do you feel about that? And I said, I feel this way, that if my son or my daughter came home with a 60% on their report card, that's an F. And that doesn't work. So to me, I, I just, I think our commitment is, is that we want to continue to look for better ways to provide services. Things change all of the time. You know, five years ago, we didn't have Evitrol. Ten years ago, we didn't have Suboxone. Um, you know, methadone was our only medication-assisted recovery choice, um, and and so 
I just, what I can say is that we'll continue to look for the best ways to do it. Using peer recovery folks is, is, a, great, is a great step and, and the, the really nice part that I enjoy about the new behavioral health redesign is, um, you know, it's now a recognized um, model of providing services and I think that that's, that's incredible. I think the, the response um, teams, Julie and, 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 and Diane that go out with the, the police officers and the sheriffs when, when somebody overdoses and we, we can use Narcan, I think the work that you guys do, I think the work that NAMI does around the mental health stuff is, is really key to, to, to solving this also. Not, not one, you know, Wilson Hall or, or, or Comquest or Phoenix Rising or Pathways, none of us individually are gonna solve this, okay? We have to work together. Um, in order to do that. So, I, you know, I've always said I'm open to any suggestions anybody has. So if you got some ideas, please feel free. Um, be glad to hear them. So. You have a question just to follow up on him. When someone completes your program, how are you tracking your long-term success? If someone's in recovery three years out, five years out, when I ask people, they their response is, we, we don't because we can't keep track of them. Well, so 500 folks showed up this past Saturday at the recovery picnic. Um, so we got to keep track of some of them that way. Um, and it's a challenge because as, as, as you know, phone numbers change. Um, you know, people, despite their, their efforts at sobriety, some of their other behaviors don't change, like how many times they change their phone number and things like that. Um, so I think we reach out to the best we get. We see them in 12-step meetings. Um, they come back for events. Our, our, folk, our staff members that take them out to 12-step meetings and see them. So a lot of the information is anecdotal, particularly after they, after they successfully get away from treatment. That's why, you know, when Judge was talking about this is a chronic disease, I think we still continue to treat it like it's a cough or a cold in 30, 60, 90, 120-day increments. And until we increase the longitude on that, on that treatment or whatever that word is, um, then I, th I, th I think we'll have a hard time getting a really accurate number. So. I, the reason I ask is I think if we can catch, whether it's mental health or addiction, yeah. we catch it at a slip before it becomes a full-blown relapse. Yep. And it's the slips that I think we're missing. Yep. And I don't know how we are able to find those. I see, you know, we're down at the exchange program. Right. And I think somebody told me once, they said, there are more people that are sober um, a year out of treatment than there are six months. So people leave treatment and they think, you know what, I think I can be a social crack cocaine user. Um, so, and, and then they find out that they can't be. Um, so so I, I think that's part of it. I, I work with a lady in Akron when I was, when I first became a clinical supervisor and she said, I'm really proud of the fact that I'm now working with a third generation of people. And I thought to myself, well, that's not something to be proud of. Wouldn't you have been happy to get it on the first time? And she said, I lacked complete understanding of addiction. And I thought to myself, no, I think you lack complete understanding that you're okay with that happening. And you're actually proud of that. And to me, that, that's, that doesn't work. So I, I don't, you know, we know there's a generational part to this. We know there's a hereditary part that it's about 55, 60% of the time it's passed down. What's challenging about the opiate stuff is those five risk factors, hereditary, the constitutional effect, the environment, the enabling, and the use. Right now, the only two things you have to have is your body reacts differently to opiates and you've used them. The other things don't matter as much as what they did before. All right, and so now we're going to be transitioning to uh, our next uh, portion of the day. And so give our panelists one more round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.